Toulouse, February 27, 1989. 21-year-old Valerie Tarot was found dead in her home. The scene that unfolded before the eyes of the police was shocking in its cruelty, Valerie lay on the bed, wearing a bathrobe, her wrists bound with a shoelace, a scarf in her mouth as a gag. It was soaked in blood that had flowed from her throat. The room floor was covered with the torn underwear of the girl, ripped in half. One obvious injury on her body was a strangulation mark on her neck. The autopsy provided even more food for thought for the police. Two scarves were found deep in Valerie's throat, and the results of the toxicological examination showed that she had been under the influence of some substances. There were so many of them that they alone could have caused her death. Furthermore, a few days earlier, a building worker in which the girl lived found Valerie's backpack in the trash. Inside were her documents, an ashtray, cigarette butts, a glass, shoes, keys to the apartment, and a blood-stained bedside lamp. Gathering all this information, the investigators concluded that the girl had voluntarily left this life. The case was closed. Of course, such a conclusion did not satisfy Valerie's relatives, who tried unsuccessfully to persuade the police to investigate the case as a murder. Eleven months later, hikers on the trail to Fenue found a wallet and documents belonging to a girl named Law Martin. On the same day, in a canal approximately 20 kilometers away in Bonrepas Raquette, they discovered the lifeless body of a 19-year-old girl. She was completely naked, except for her socks. It was indeed Law, who had been missing for two days. The autopsy revealed that the girl died from strangulation. However, prior to her death, she had been sexually assaulted anally and vaginally with an object, apparently a baseball bat. Additionally, the forensic expert found a torn spleen, indicating a very strong blow to the abdomen, such as a kick. The police began an investigation, but the investigators did not come across any significant leads, and of course, it never occurred to anyone to establish a connection between the two cases. Seven years passed, and it was the morning of February 11, 1997. At nine o'clock in the morning, Firefighters entered an apartment in a multi-story building located on the fourth floor in Toulouse. Inside, they discovered the lifeless and charred body of a 29-year-old woman named Martin Matthias. Martin was lying face down on the bed. On the floor, there was a magazine from an automatic pistol, and in the bathroom, there was a blood-stained and torn bra. The bathtub and the carpet was stained with blood, and there was also a light bulb on the floor, which had been unscrewed. The firefighters concluded that there were two points of fire, two clear attempts of deliberate arson in the bedroom, and in the living room near the armchair. The police inspector in charge of the investigation combined all these pieces of evidence and concluded that Martin's death occurred as a result of a decision made by Martin herself. Ten days later, on February 22, 1997, 21-year-old Emily Isps entered a bar in Toulouse. It was the afternoon, and she wanted to have a drink with her friends. In the bar, she met a pleasant and attractive guy named Patrice. Patrice had his own way of attracting girls because he distributed prohibited substances to Emily and her friends. Patrice and Emily spent the remaining part of the day and the following morning together. In the evening, the young man planned to go to a concert and invited Emily to join him. She accepted his invitation. However, before the concert, they met up with Patrice's friend, Eve, with whom he had been living for some time. The group of young people had dinner together and had some drinks. Then Patrice and Emily got into Patrice's car and headed to the concert, which they arrived at around 1.30 am. Emily danced a lot while Patrice spent more time at the bar drinking beer. Around two o'clock in the morning, Emily, feeling tired as she hadn't slept for two days, asked her new acquaintance to drive her home. The exhausted girl hadn't even had a chance to sit in the car when she immediately fell asleep. When she woke up, it seemed to her that only a moment had passed, but she was already lying on the back seat of the car. Opening her eyes, Emily was astonished to see Patrice above her with bulging eyes, choking her. He no longer resembled the pleasant guy she had spent the whole day with. Emily couldn't understand how someone could spend an entire day with such a nice guy and then, 
Within a minute, he turned into a monster who was now strangling her. Emily tried to resist. She screamed, scratched Patrice, and tried to tear his hair. He ordered her to shut up and struck her face several times, after which Emily lost consciousness. A few minutes later, she woke up without her panties. He must have tried to violate her. Emily thought that she probably wouldn't survive and decided to pretend to be dead or talk to him. She chose to talk to Patrice, trying to remain calm and relieve tension. She repeated that she understood everything, that such things happen when someone drinks too much, that everything was fine, and she wouldn't tell anyone anything. Patrice stopped the car and asked her to please him. Emily refused, then he moved to the back seat with her, continued undressing her, and violated her again. Emily did her best to stay calm. She continued talking to him, minimizing the harm he had caused her. Suddenly, Patrice burst into tears and said he regretted what he had done. He said to Emily, you hold ten years of my life in your hands. Emily didn't think he was such a great actor, so he must have been sincere. Hope arose within her again. Emily calms down her assailant and tormentor. She speaks to him softly because her only thought is to get out of this nightmare alive. She managed to calm Patrice down, and she asked him to drive her home. He refused. So they went to Eve, a friend where Patrice was staying. They lay down to sleep together in one bed, but Patrice didn't touch Emily anymore. Expectation set in. Emily went through hell, but she's alive. She knew that it was in the neighboring room so she felt slightly safer, despite the fact that the attacker was sleeping just a few centimeters away from her. The girl managed to doze off for a few hours until she heard Eve and his girlfriend wake up. Emily got up and found them in the kitchen. Eve and Nora, his girlfriend, were horrified when they saw bruises on Emily's face. She explained to them that she was attacked by a guy at the concert. She didn't see his face because it was covered by a hood. Emily lied, protecting Patrice, but mainly to protect herself. After all, she was still in a state of shock and deeply shaken. Perhaps she wasn't fully aware of what was happening, as if her soul had detached from her body. This is a common defense mechanism for people who have experienced trauma. If quietly took her aside and asked if Patrice had anything to do with it, because even though Patrice was staying with him, if knew that his ex-girlfriend had kicked him out after a major argument, and if didn't fully trust him. Nora insists that Patrice had nothing to do with it, that it was a guy from the concert. Patrice woke up and also went to the kitchen. He confirmed Emily's story, yes, it was a guy in a hood, unfortunately, there was no chance of catching him. In any case, Nora drove Emily to the hospital. Doctors found signs of strangulation on the girl's neck. Additionally, she had several injuries on her face. She would have to spend a few days in the hospital under medical observation. In the hospital, Emily finally felt safer. She decided to tell the truth about what really happened, that Patrice attacked her. However, he suspected that Emily might confess everything, so he had already disappeared. Now, after one of Patrice's victims survived, the police finally start searching for him. He will be on the run for three months. On June 14, 1997, at a rural festival, Patrice, who now calls himself Frank, met Murray Norman. Murray, 35 years old, lived in a chalet in a small town below Foire. Murray felt sorry for the young man who complained about having nowhere to stay and offered him to live with her in exchange for doing some housework. Besides, on the 20th, Murray planned to visit her parents and decided that Frank would take care of the house. That's how Murray and Frank lived together for several days. During the day, he worked in the garden, fixed things, and in the evening, they had dinner together, talked, and smoked. On June 19th, Murray and Frank had a great time. Murray got a new job at a wolf sanctuary in Orlu, so she arranged a celebratory dinner. They drank a lot and smoked cannabis. Obviously, both of them were in an uplifted mood, and Frank, that is, Patrice, tried to kiss Murray. But she clearly wasn't ready for it and went into the bedroom, trying to avoid an unpleasant situation. 
However, the man followed her into the room, grabbed her by the head, and hit her against the wall. Murray felt dizzy, but she managed to break free from his grasp. Then Patrice picked up a chair and hit his victim, who had fallen unconscious on the bed. He brutally assaulted her several times. When this brought her back to consciousness, he started choking her with his bare hands, but when he released her throat, Murray was still breathing. Then Patrice tied her ankles and wrists and gagged her. After doing all this, he took Murray's body to the first floor and began cleaning up to remove all traces of blood. He painted the blue carpet with blue paint to conceal the blood stains. He used an angle grinder to remove the top layer of wooden furniture that had blood stains on it. The killer burned Murray's sheets and clothes in the garden and washed his own in the washing machine. Then he wrapped the victim's body in a blanket, dug a hole in the garden, and buried Murray in her own garden the following evening. Before leaving the chalet, he stole 5,000 francs in cash and some valuable items that could be sold, including the angle grinder. And in an attempt to divert suspicion from himself, he left a note on the table, Murray, I don't know where you are, I finished my work and I'm leaving. On June 20, 1997, Patrice was driving Murray's car and heading to Spain. It was also his 29th birthday. A few days later, Patrice was already in Alicante, in the south of Spain. There he met two French girls, Isabel and Valerie. The young people quickly became friends and spent several days together, sunbathing on the beach, having meals together, and going for walks. Then the girls' vacation ended, and it was time for them to return to Paris. They promised to meet again someday and exchanged phone numbers. If only they knew. Patrice continued his journey, visiting Germany and Belgium, before arriving in Paris on September 1, 1997. Of course, he called Isabel and Valerie, and that same evening they agreed to have dinner together at a restaurant. The girls were happy to see their new friend again, but Patrice explained his situation to them, his car and all his money had been stolen. He was quite skilled at portraying himself as a victim. He asked the girls if one of them could let him stay with them for two days before his departure. Valerie couldn't accommodate him, as she was leaving for a business trip the next day, but Isabel allowed him to spend the night on her sofa, with the condition that it wouldn't exceed four days. On September 4, 1997, the residents of the same apartment building where 31-year-old Isabel Shicheri lived woke up to a loud explosion. It turned out that the explosion followed a fire that had started in the girl's apartment. Her partially burned body was found lying on the bed. The gas burners in the kitchen were turned on, and the fire broke out near the bathroom. It was evident that Isabel's death was not accidental, the front door was not forced open, and there were three glasses, a bottle of pink wine, and champagne on the table. The wounds on the victim's body indicated the incredible cruelty of the killer, there was blood in the toilet, and blood was flowing from her mouth, nose, and anus. However, no trace of semen was found on Isabel's body. Instead, a blood-stained carrot was found near the mattress. The autopsy would confirm that the perpetrator tortured the girl with it. Moreover, she had been severely beaten. The blows were inflicted all over her body, but mainly on her face. Asphyxiation was the cause of death. When investigators learned that Isabel had sheltered a man named Patrice, they immediately paid attention to this detail because the police had been searching for a certain Patrice for some time. And it was all thanks to the testimony of Emily Espy, who managed to survive Patrice Allegre's attack at the end of February. Then, after the disappearance of Mireille Norman, her relatives, who were expecting her as a guest, became worried. However, it took three weeks before her body was found tied up and buried in the garden. But after the discovery of the body, the gendarme's suspicions were closely linked to Patrice. Because although he presented himself under a false name, many witnesses had seen his face and recognized him from the pictures presented by the investigators. When he returned to Paris in early September, he was already actively being sought. The search warrant for him circulated throughout France. The police contacted his relatives and friends and promised a reward for assistance in his capture. 
and then Patrice contacted a friend and asked if he could stay overnight in Paris. That's when the investigators saw an opportunity to apprehend him. They asked this man to call Patrice back and direct him to an ideal location for capture in Chateauneuf Malabry. On September 5, 1997, at 5.10 pm, Patrice entered the house where the police were already hiding. He didn't resist arrest. According to some witnesses, he even seemed relieved to be arrested, as if he were tired of hiding. Surprisingly, the arrest of the serial killer did not attract much attention from the public. Perhaps it was because the media did not report that a serial killer was on the run, as the investigators initially could not establish a connection between the different cases. But it was also because another tragedy dominated the headlines, the car accident, and the death of Princess Diana in Paris on August 31, 1997. As a result, Patrice's arrest did not receive much attention. It didn't make big headlines. When he was interrogated, Patrice willingly cooperated. He confessed to his crimes and described them in detail. It was horrifying because he described them in the present tense, as if reliving them, but with a completely detached expression. Patrice was arrested for the attack on Emily Espy and the murders of Mireille Norman and Isabel Chicherry. However, when Patrice talked about Mireille Norman, the girl who allowed him to stay in her chalet in exchange for work in the garden, he referred to her by a different name. He called her Martin, which made the investigators wonder. Gradually, they began to realize that he was confusing her with another one of his victims. Knowing Patrice's affinity for elements of luxury life, investigators offer him champagne, oysters, foie gras, and more outdoor walks in exchange for him revealing information about his other victims. And indeed, after this, Patrice confessed to killing three more women, Martin Mathias, Law Martin, and Valerie Theriot. Only after the puzzle pieces started coming together as evidence, already known to the detectives. As it is already known, in the cases of Martin Mathias and Valerie Theriot, investigators concluded that they had taken their own lives. However, it turned out that Patrice personally knew all the women. Valerie Theriot was his colleague, they both worked as waiters at the same café in Toulouse. Law Martin lived with him in the same region of Toulouse, so she got into his car because she recognized him. As for Martin Mathias, she was Patrice's neighbor. They lived in apartments opposite each other. In other words, from the very beginning, many clues pointed to Patrice Allegre as a possible suspect, but investigators did not notice them for a long time. It was unusual for a serial killer, Patrice knew all his victims personally, even if sometimes only for a couple of days, as in the case of Emily, but he always followed the same script, we spend time together, go out, become friends, and then an attack follows. Although Patrice assisted the investigation during interrogations and quickly confessed to the killings, investigators and later psychiatrists noticed that when it came to discussing the murders, he found it much more difficult to provide explanations. Each time, his version of events sounded like this, he tried to kiss the victim, she refused, he became enraged and strangled her. In some cases he used objects to assault the victims, but the man himself insisted that he did everything alone. This indicates that his version of the murders and attacks does not correspond to reality. Is it a lie or does he remember the events poorly? It's hard to say, but in any case, it casts doubt on his confession. For example, let's consider the case of Martin Mathias. Patrice recalls how he met her at McDonald's in early February 1997. He asked if he could sit at her table, and they started talking, finding a common topic in boxing. Martin Mathias was the boxing champion of France, and Patrice had practiced it in the past. According to Patrice, Martin agreed to meet him again and invited him to have a drink at her place a few days later, and it was during this meeting that everything went wrong. However, the autopsy doesn't fully support this version. Toxicological analysis revealed alcohol and chloroform in her system, even though she didn't drink, and there was a mark of an electric shock in the intimate area of her body. As you may recall, a light bulb was unscrewed in the apartment, and something was done to the electrical wiring. This leads to the speculation that the girl did not invite Patrice to her place, 
but he stalked her because he lived across the street. Then he incapacitated her because under normal circumstances, Martin Matthias was stronger than him. Of course, there are no facts that definitively confirm this, but it is important to note that there are discrepancies between the story told by the killer and the evidence. And this implies that he is not striving to be completely honest with the investigation. Moreover, he spoke eagerly, and extensively about his childhood. Patrice was born on June 20th in Toulouse. His mother, Michelle, was a hairdresser and became pregnant with a boy at the age of 17. His father, Roland, was four years older than her and worked as a police officer. Patrice always knew that he was an unwanted child. Seven years later, Michelle and Roland had their second son, a desired child. Patrice's childhood could not be called happy. His parents often argued, and his father would physically abuse his mother. Patrice tried to intervene, but he only ended up getting beaten himself. Roland, being a police officer, was often absent from home, paying little attention to his son. Patrice's mother, on the other hand, showed little affection towards him. However, she was an alcoholic, and when Patrice was young, she fell into an alcoholic coma right in front of him in her beauty salon. She was also unfaithful to her husband and constantly cheated on him. Patrice became a witness to some of her intimate encounters as well as the reconciliations between Michelle and Roland after fights. Often, when he tried to sleep in his room, he would hear his mother's moans from the adjacent room and would cover his head with a pillow, trying to drown out those sounds. Another time, she derived pleasure from one of her friends in the car while six-year-old Patrice sat in the back seat and saw everything. Despite all this, Patrice despised his father and idealized his mother. He would defend her and couldn't stand it when people spoke ill of her. He had difficulty studying in school, and he had to repeat a year several times. He would skip classes, and his mother allowed him to do so. During this time, he began committing crimes, stealing and selling drugs. However, every time he was arrested, his father would come to his rescue. For example, Roland once paid 30,000 francs as compensation to the victims of Patrice's thefts. The roots of his behavior possibly trace back to a traumatic event that occurred when he was 13 years old. He ran away from home, and two boys abducted him. They drugged the boy with heavy illicit substances and subjected him to abuse in a car, after which they discarded him on the side of a remote road. This couldn't have left scars on a boy who was not yet 14 years old. This certainly doesn't justify what he did afterwards, but it provides an opportunity to better understand him. It was from the age of 14, that he started drinking heavily and using illicit substances. The problem was that Patrick, who was described as charming when sober, completely changed under the influence of some substances. He became truly aggressive to the point where his friends who knew about it were afraid of him. Once, when he was drunk at a bar, someone said something bad about his younger brother, and Patrick flew into a rage. He left, but then returned to the bar with a weapon, which he held to the person's head and pulled the trigger. By some miracle, the gun didn't fire, and Patrick was apprehended. It could have been his first and last murder. Patrice Allegre committed his first attack on a girl when he was only 17 years old. He met the girl at a party, and initially, everything was going fine. They went to a park where Patrice tried to make advances towards the girl, but she pushed him away. As you can already understand by this point, rejections drove him into a rage. The guy started choking the girl but quickly stopped, apologized, and took her home. However, his modus operandi was already beginning to emerge. Interestingly, Patrice never had problems with girls, but the problem was that there were these two sides, as long as the girl agreed, he was charming, but if she rejected him, he obtained what he desired by force. As for long-lasting romantic relationships, Patrice had two of them in his life. The first one was with a woman named Cecile. They met in 1986 when Patrice was 18, and it was their first true love story. The young couple dated for seven years, and they had a daughter together. However, in 1989, 
A few months after committing his first murder, their relationship ended. Their relationship resembled the relationship of Patrice's parents. They would argue a lot, and Patrice would physically attack Cecile. But with Cecile, Patrice could somewhat restrain himself. For example, when he attempted to strangle her, he stopped with the words, No, not you, not you. In 1994, Cecile ended up in the hospital with a broken jaw. She filed a complaint against Patrice, who was arrested for several weeks. In 1995, Cecile finally decided to break up with Patrice. The following year, he met Sylvie, with whom he would live until February 1997 when Sylvie also left Patrice due to his aggression. It was precisely then that Patrice moved into his friend Eve house and attacked Emily Isps. The trial of Patrice began on February 11, 2002, in Toulouse. He was accused of six acts of violence, five murders, and one attempted murder. During the trial, questions arose about numerous mistakes made by the police during the investigation of Valerie Tarriot and Martin Matthias, who concluded it was a suicide. There were even rumors that the police were protecting Patrice, considering his father was one of them. However, this was just a conspiracy theory. Patrice's case was subject to analysis by psychiatrists, which was rare for criminal cases in France. One of the most interesting aspects was his contrasting attitudes towards his mother and father. He idealized his mother but demonized his father. At the age of 13, he even suggested to his mother that they should kill his father. Despite this, Roland Allegre, Patrice's father, appeared in court, took the witness stand, and looked his son in the eyes, saying that despite everything he had done, he still loved him. Patrice's response was, well, I don't love you, I hate you, I should have killed you, as I told mom, then I wouldn't have caused so much harm. He drew a parallel between his crimes and his father. However, he always refused to blame his mother for anything. Psychiatrists believe that a significant influence on him was the trauma caused by his mother's intimate explosions. Once terrorized by his mother's moans as a child, he transformed into a strong man who terrorized women, suppressing their moans, the very soul of these women. Interestingly, he always attacked his victims when they were unconscious, and the first victim who managed to calm him down, convince him not to kill her, was Emily, who was lucky enough to wake up and speak to him. Such a feeling as if he could render girls unconscious, he could do whatever he wanted with them, but when Emily woke up, she regained her human face. He himself said, I have a memory lapse. I remember choking her. Then she came to, and I apologized. It brought me to my senses. I'm ashamed of what I did. I don't know what to say. It is also interesting why girls suddenly refused him, even though it seemed obvious that there was an attraction between the young people. The psychologist thinks that he himself provoked the women's rejection, subconsciously, of course. He wanted to have power over the victims because it is common among killers who have themselves experienced violence in childhood. He wanted to transform from a passive victim into an active killer who could fully control the situation. It was their abnormal way of regaining control over the situation. As for the motive, it would seem easy to answer this question since he violated all his victims. However, it's not that simple. Although this explanation seems most obvious, he himself confirmed that he did not derive pleasure during the attacks. According to a psychiatrist who examined him, for someone who sometimes has normal relationships and at other times commits terrible murders, he is not simply a sexual maniac. Having control over the situation was of much greater significance. In essence, it was violence that turned into humiliation rather than humiliation turning into violence. He himself could never answer why he killed. He hoped that psychiatrists would provide him with an answer to this question, which is why he eagerly spoke with them. At the trial, another important question arose. Did Patrice have other victims, especially during the break between 1990 and 1997? Since some of his known victims did not receive proper investigation, it is quite possible. Patrice himself claims that he did not kill anyone else, but can he be trusted? Initially, 
he only confessed to two murders and one act of violence. The police formed a team of specialists to determine if he could be responsible for other unsolved crimes. Another promise of a walk, as well as champagne and oysters, allowed them to elicit a hint from Patrice about the unsolved case of Lynn Gabaldi's murder. They examined 191 unsolved cases since 1984, and they managed to find two witnesses who were former prostitutes involved in Lynn Gabaldi's case. Florencia Kiliafi, who appeared in the press under the pseudonym Fanny, and Christelle Berg, known to the public as Patricia. Together, they accused Patrice of Lynn's death. However, in addition to him, they implicated the prosecutor of Toulouse, Marc Bourrage, in criminal activities. Allegedly, he organized sadomasochistic parties where politicians and judges would enjoy themselves. Fanny claimed that the girls did not attend the parties willingly. They were subjected to abuse, torture, and sometimes killed. And Lynn Gabaldi provided the prostitutes for the orgies. She threatened to expose everything to the police, so on the orders of Marc Bourrage, Patrice killed her. Dominique Bodies' name was mentioned once. He was the former mayor of Toulouse. Supposedly, he was present during Lynn's murder along with Bourrage. Seeing the growing tension surrounding his case, Patrice wrote a letter to a well-known show, stating that Bodies and Bourrage were indeed part of a criminal network. Two weeks later, the same show aired an interview with Fanny, who talked about the children she saw chained in a torture room on the ground floor of a house near Toulouse. However, just 15 days after confessing to Lynn Gabaldi's murder, Patrice retracted his statement. It was later revealed that the show's producers had generously paid Patrice and Fanny for their stories. It also emerged that Dominique Bodies couldn't have been present at Lynn's murder because he was in Paris. And Marc Bourrage didn't even know Patrice. The accusations against the politicians were dropped, and Patrice and Fanny were charged with providing false testimony. In July 2005, Fanny and Patrice were sentenced to 18 months and three years in prison, respectively, for giving false testimony. On February 21, 2002, Patrice Allegre was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 22 years. He is now 54 years old and has already served the mandatory 22 years. During this time, he entered into a relationship with a psychologist from Canada who moved to France and settled closer to her beloved in prison. Surely, Patrice wants to see the woman and his daughter outside of prison. He applied for early release but abandoned the idea due to the conclusions of psychiatrists who believe that despite all his efforts, he has not been rehabilitated, and the risk of relapse is extremely high. Emily Isps, the only surviving victim of Patrice's attack, who testified against her assailant in court, passed away in 2006, nine years after the incident. Unfortunately, she made this decision on her own.